You're watching the Aramco 2022 F1 Car Reveal Series. The Ferrari F175, named in celebration of 75 years of the prancing horse, is the car Formula 1's most famous team hopes will propel it back into title contention. It certainly pulled out all of the stops thanks to what team principal Mattia Bonotto has described as a brave Ferrari to take on the challenges of F1's dramatic regulation changes. When it comes to thinking outside the box, a phrase Bonotto used of the design approach, he must have been talking about Ferrari's unique side pod design. This area is the one that has produced the most variations in the 2022 cars we've seen so far, but no team has gone as aggressive as Ferrari has. Ferrari has taken a bold approach knowing that it needs to get back to the front this year after its recent struggles, with its last victory coming in Singapore in 2019 courtesy of Sebastian Vettel. Ferrari has undoubtedly been bold with the F175. The question is, will it bring back the glory days, or has it perhaps gone too far in trying to outsmart the rest? With the help of the race's technical expert Gary Anderson and illustrator Rosario Giuliana, let's take a look at the car. Let's get straight into the side pods. So far, most teams have been on a spectrum stretching from the McLaren and Williams style minimalist design all the way to Aston Martin's long, wide side pods with aggressive undercut. Ferrari is closer to the Aston Martin design, but it has taken a very different approach with what Gary Anderson has described as valleys in the side pod surface shape. Looking at the front of the side pods, the radiator inlet is conventional, located as high as possible, and uses width rather than the maximum permitted height to get the required opening sizes. Judging by the side of the rollover bar inlet, most of its cooling is being done through the side pod inlets. These exit through the louvres on the top surface of the side pod, which is something we have also seen from Aston Martin. But it differs dramatically from Aston Martin on the top surface of the side pods. This is where the valley comes in. Effectively, the two sides of the valley are the front of the side pod at the top of the radiator inlet and the rear ahead of the forward leg of the top rear suspension wishbone. The regulations allow a maximum radius of 50mm in this concave shape. As Gary Anderson points out, it might make sense to sweep the top surface downward to help contain the low energy airflow emerging from the louvres, but they are closer to the centre of the car, and this shape will also compromise the packaging under the skin. It's also unusual that the shape of the side pod turns upwards at the rear of the side pod, when normally this would either have a downwash element or at least aim at the beam wing. The aggressive undercut on the front part of the side pod then effectively comes to nothing, where the side pod shape becomes more boxy further back. Anderson believes this gives it the air of a car that has been designed in two parts and doesn't entirely meet in the middle. It's possible this truncated undercut exists to act as an extra diffuser that scavenges airflow out from under the front corner of the underfloor. However, there's nothing on the floor design we've seen that assists with this, but perhaps that is something that is hidden on the launch car. That makes it a large, square side pod with little undercut leading to the coat bottle area, so let's see what happens when the car runs for real. The coke bottle is relatively old fashioned, it starts very abruptly with the sidewall undercutting the top area, which is used as a cooling outlet. Like the Williams, the bodywork simply stops at the front of the rear tyres. Turning our attention to the front of the car, Ferrari does not have a continuous slot gap between the first and second elements. The main plane is attached directly to the nose. To reduce the stagnation point for the airflow hitting the nose, Ferrari has gone for a pointy design. There's a possibility this could be a launch spec design that won't be seen when the car hits the track, but if it is a fake nose, Ferrari has gone further than some other teams in designing its own alternative, rather than simply copying the F1 show car that was released last year. The front element of the front wing has a large spoon section in the middle, which is quite wide and also lower. This is about trying to make this area work to produce front downforce. The front two elements mount the front wing to the nose, and the third and fourth elements run into the sides of the nose. The end plates have the customary ski ramp on the outer surface. This helps with managing the tyre squirt and the negative effect that could have on the performance of the front wing. Looking at the nose itself, it's more akin to the Williams, with the top surface more curved. This will allow the airflow passing over it to go around the sides of the nose more easily. The front suspension is a conventional pushrod actuated double wishbone, ending speculation about whether Ferrari would switch to pull rods. That also suggests that what we saw from the Haas, which uses Ferrari components, was broadly accurate. 
there's also a small amount of anti-dive on the top wishbone, either to mitigate dive under braking or to give more control over the wake coming off the trailing edge of the front wing. The turning vane at the front of the side pod looks like it's to the maximum length permitted. This is there to separate the turbulent weight coming off the rear of the front tyre and ensure it passes along the outside of the side pod as hoped. Ferrari also has a secondary dive plane mounted on the chassis to floor mounting keel. The outer trailing corner of this will set up a strong vortex to pass along the inner corner of the inner side and top surface of the underfloor. The leading edge of the underfloor has a relatively high inlet that sweeps downwards, but the leading edge is also quite small, meaning it will be fairly critical in how it responds to the angle of attack of the airflow. By sweeping downwards as it goes outboard, it allows a little more space outboard for the undercut side pod leading edge. This starts off from the keel under the chassis, but then it more or less finishes as soon as it gets to the vicinity of the outer extremity of the side pod. Ferrari was cautious about what rear detail it showed us, but the rear suspension is a pull rod configuration. The top wishbone has a fairly wide base. The lower wishbone shrouds the drive shaft in the same fairing and also has a very rearward forward leg. This is to minimise the blockage through this area and allow the airflow over the upper diffuser surface to travel as fast as possible. The rear track rod is just behind this drive shaft shroud and might even be an all-in-one component with shims at the end to adjust the toe in out. We can't see the diffuser but the rear wing is mounted on twin pillars with a central DRS actuator. It also features end plates that sweep rearwards a little differently from the rest. But again, let's see what it looks like on a real car when it runs. And Ferrari has also promised prodigious development for the car mentioning that it has not yet achieved all of its goals. So that means there's plenty to be gained with in-season development. And of course, the car houses the all-important power unit package. According to engine chief Enrico Galtieri, Ferrari has been forced to make some daring design decisions in a power unit package that is very different. You're watching the Aramco 2022 F1 car reveal series. Ferrari hopes to and indeed must, complete its recovery from the hit its power unit performance took in 2020. That was a consequence of a raft of technical directives issued by the FIA in collaboration with Ferrari itself after unproven suspicions the team was operating its power unit illegally at times. This led to its pace slumping in 2020 as it struggled for straight line speed, leaving it mired in the midfield. Last year, Ferrari made an encouraging step forward and established itself as the third strongest engine manufacturer. The introduction of a significant hybrid upgrade with a new energy store that increased it from a 400 volt to an 800 volt system in the final third of the season was also an important step. With the engine freeze kicking in this year, with two sets of homologation deadlines, one in March and one in September, Ferrari needs to get on level terms with Mercedes and the Red Bull badged Honda engines. There's an added dimension to this challenge given all manufacturers have to adapt to the introduction of E10 fuel containing 10% renewable ethanol. That has created a challenge both for Ferrari and fuel supplier Shell. While the hybrid system is largely carried over with just a few tweaks, Ferrari team principal Mattia Binotto has described the 2022 power unit as significantly different. The V6 engine itself has been a key area of focus, with Ferrari making some significant progress with combustion technology that it hopes will make its engines capable of winning races again. This built on significant improvements thanks to a combustion chamber redesign for 2021. Not only is this vital if Ferrari is to return to being a championship threat in F1, but also to prevent Mercedes from overhauling its record for race victories in the coming years. Ferrari's ability to win a first title since it took the Constructors' Championship back in 2008 doesn't just depend on engine performance. The whole team has changed significantly in recent years, both to tackle its own weaknesses and adapt to the challenges of F1 under a cost cap. Along with Red Bull and Mercedes, Ferrari is one of the teams that has had to make the biggest changes because of the cost cap, with the baseline figure for this dropping to $140 million this year. While the series of restructures that have been implemented in the past two years might seem like a team in a state of flux, they were forced by the need not only to adapt to the cost cap, but also take on the challenge of the carryover 2021 cars. This means the current structure is a logical one. 
In parallel with this, there's also been a push to improve the team infrastructure. This includes the introduction of a new state-of-the-art driver in loop simulator at Maranello. This got up and running last season and was used for race weekend support for the first time at the penultimate race of the season in Saudi Arabia. But there has also been a big push to improve everything from reliability to simulation tools, having been left behind by Mercedes and Red Bull during the past dozen years. Last year, strides were also made in terms of tyre management after problems in the first half of the season. What's more, Ferrari improved dramatically in terms of pit stops, increasing its number of sub 3 second pit stops from 48% in 2020 to 73% last year, with its average time dropping from 2.72 seconds to 2.55 seconds. By Ferrari's own metrics, this made it the third best in F1. All of this added up to finishing third in the Constructors' Championship, albeit well behind Mercedes and Red Bull. But although it only overhauled McLaren in the closing stages of the year, it was definitively the stronger car in the second half of the season. Last year, finishing third was Ferrari's target. But this year, the priority is re-emerging as a consistent challenger for race wins. It's made all the right moves and a lot has changed for the better at Maranello over the past couple of years. And one thing is for sure, in Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz, it definitely has the driver lineup to make the most of a race winning car. That's why, in 2022, Ferrari must deliver.